In this video lecture, I'm going to cover the first chapter of the Zumdahl and Zumdahl chemistry textbook, which is focused on measurement and some other quantitative subjects which you should have seen in a previous introductory chemistry course. I'll be going back and forth in these video lectures between my PowerPoints and the course notes, uh, which will be available on the course website as well. Uh, so I'm largely going to try to use the course notes uh, when I don't need to refer to specific images, and then kind of go back and forth between them as necessary. So the first thing I'm going to start with here is reviewing how we measure. Uh, you'll recall that what we do in this process is for any type of a device which has a scale, uh, like for example a graduated cylinder, a thermometer, anything like that, we identify the smallest markings on those scales or the smallest intervals. Uh, so for example on a 10 milliliter graduate cylinder smallest intervals are tenths of a milliliter. And then what you do is you estimate the value of the measurement exactly one decimal place beyond that, one decimal place to the right. So in this scenario if the smallest markings are tenths of a milliliter you would record uh, your measurement to the hundredths place. And let's say the smallest markings, like on a thermometer, were to the ones place, then in that case you would take your measurement to the tenths. Okay. Uh, a lot of this process is designed to take care of any uncertainty that we have in a measurement. And except for what we would call exact numbers, there's always going to be uncertainty in a measurement. Uh, and that last digit, the one that we estimated, is always called the uncertain digit in such a measurement. Any other digits that we have are called certain digits, and taken collectively, these are called the significant digits or the significant figures. So let's look at a couple examples here. So let's say we have a measurement that's written down that we're trying to interpret, and the measurement says it's 13.87 centimeters. Which digits are certain, which are uncertain, and which are significant? Well, the certain digits are all of the digits except for the last one. So if I was to write them out, I could just write these as digits. I'm just going to write it as the 13.8. Those are certain digits. And then that 7 at the end is the uncertain digits. And then taken all together, all of those digits, the 1, the 3, the 8, and the 7, are considered significant. What if we have a digital balance? Do the rules still apply? And the answer is yes. So same procedure. All the digits except for the last one are considered certain, 14.523. And then that zero at the end of the number is considered to be the uncertain digit. And then which of them are considered significant? All of them. So the one, the four, the five, the two, the three, the zero. So if we're looking at a balance, for example, then this is telling us that in the uh, ten thousandths place, we're not entirely sure about the accuracy of that value. It could be a little bit higher, it could be a little bit lower. How far off it is is generally indicated on the instrument. So for example, on our electronic balances in the class, it'll say uh, plus or minus, uh, I believe it's two ten thousandths or maybe three ten thousandths. So that tells you uh, how far off those could be. A thermometer might say over a range that it's plus or minus 0 0.2 centimeters. So if we're using, for example, a particular thermometer that has that uncertainty, how would we interpret an uncertainty of 25.7 degrees Celsius? Well, that means that this number could actually be 0.2 lower or low 0.2 higher. So what we would say here is the actual value is in a range that includes those uncertainties there. And that would be uh, 25.7 minus 0 0.2, which would be 25.5. And then we would add 0 0.2. Uh, so to 25. 
nine degrees Celsius. Okay, that's how we should look at it. The real value is somewhere in there. Now, in general, if you're not told otherwise, just always assume that the uncertainty is plus or minus one of whatever the uncertain digit is. So, for example, in the case of this measurement here with the ruler, 13.87, it would be plus or minus one in the hundredths place. So plus or minus one hundredth. Using the digital balance, unless we saw other instructions, we would assume it's plus or minus one ten thousandth of a gram. Okay. So we'd mentioned that just a second ago, if we had 13.47 centimeters, no additional information means that the value is somewhere in the range between 13.46 to 13.48. That would be our assumption. These rules don't apply to all measurements that we would interpret, but they do for the vast majority of them. Some measurements, though, uh, can be described as being exact values. And where we deal with exact values are typically in the cases of counting numbers that are rather small. So, for example, if I'm counting the number of coins in a cup, or I'm counting the number of people in a room, anything like that, those numbers can be determined exactly, and so uh, we don't say that there's any uncertainty whatsoever in those types of measurements. Also, whenever we're dealing with any kind of a defined value, uh, a defined value is not considered to be a measurement. So, for example, there are exactly 12 inches in a foot. It's not 12.0 or 12.00 or 12.000. That's not what it is. It's exactly 12 inches in a foot. We don't say that 12 has two significant digits. We just say it is an exact number. Okay, moving on a little bit further here. When we describe how good a measurement is, there are two measurements, uh, types of qualities that we take into account. We take into account a measurement's accuracy as well as its precision. When we say that a value is accurate, its value is close to the actual true value. Uh, so for example, if we have a pill that has 50.0 milligrams of vitamin C in it, and we analyze it, and one scientist analyzes that and comes out with 50.2 as being the number of milligrams of vitamin C, the other scientist comes out with 55.3 there. Okay. What we'd say then is the first scientist is more accurate. They are closer to the true value than the second scientist. Now, the problem, of course, with accuracy is a lot of the times you don't know what the true value is. And a lot of our labs are, in fact, designed to test your technique by seeing how accurate your results are. So it's very difficult in many scenarios to actually say what your accuracy is if it's something which uh, you have to discover on your own as a result of experiments. Another uh, measurement uh, technique that we use is to look at how precise a measurement is. Now we often, since we don't know a value's accuracy easily, what we'll often do is repeat a process over many, many times to see that we are getting consistent values. So we do that to establish the precision. We want to see if all of our measurements are fairly consistent over a number of trials. If we go ahead and take a look, for example, here at a diagram modeling precision and accuracy as a dartboard, we could define accurate as hitting the bullseye. Okay, so if we define the true value as the bullseye, the first drawing here, drawing A, is not accurate nor is it precise because on the one hand, uh, the values are nowhere near the actual value that we expect, the bullseye, so that's not accurate. 
And furthermore, the values are all over the place. They are not consistent. So therefore, we would say it is not precise. If we go ahead and look at look, draw, uh, drawing B here, we'll notice that the values are consistent. They're way off from the bullseye here, so they're not accurate. But since they are consistently hitting the same place, we could say that this player is precise. And getting this player to become a much better player than, say, A would be easier. Because all you have to do is get this particular person to maybe move a little bit to the left and kneel down just a bit when they're throwing, and we'll find that they can hit the bullseye fairly consistently. So accurate and precise would be described as getting the true value as well as being consistent throughout. All right, so let's analyze a few different samples here. So let's say we have three students. We're going to just call them student one, two, and three. And they're trying to figure out the concentration of lead in parts per million. And every one of them carries out four trials. And these are the results that they get here. Um, now, they don't know this, but the actual concentration of the lead is 15.0 ppm. That's something their instructor would keep in reserve to see how well they're doing. So we want to look at the accuracy of each result. And then we also want to go ahead and characterize whether or not uh, the results are precise or not. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my notes view. And I want to note that I actually want to know not just the accuracy, but the general precision as well. All right, so let's take a look at student one. Their average is 25.2. The average should be 15.0. That's what we said it should be. So student one is not accurate. However, you'll notice that their values are relatively consistent here. Uh, they're going from a low of 24.8 to a high of 25.8. So that one's a little bit far off. Uh, number four. But on the whole, I would say that they are precise. Student two. Their average is, again, nowhere near the expected value of 15 parts per million, so they are not accurate. And if we look at the range of their data, they're going from a low of 17.3 all the way to a high of 52.1. There doesn't seem to be any kind of pattern in their values here. They're just seemingly generating random numbers there. So they're not consistent, not accurate. So we'd say not accurate, nor are they precise. Finally, if we look at student three, they're getting an average of 15.1, which is uh, very close to the true value. So relatively speaking, I would say their results are accurate. And although it's not always the case, in very rare circumstances would it not be the case, uh, they are consistently getting the same general results here. So they are accurate and they are precise. Is it possible someone could get values which are accurate but not precise? Well, that might appear to be the case in some circumstances. Uh, where, for example, these values might widely differ. For example, you know, there might be a 7.5 here, and a 30 here, and a 15.3 here, and a 15.1 uh, here, and you'd get pretty much about the same average. Uh, but the only way really for that to happen is for someone to just get lucky. So that's just random luck if someone gets the right answer without being precise. So uh, we don't expect that kind of a result to occur uh, with any kind of uh, frequency.